Good morning and welcome to Stonehouse Baptist Church Online. It's September the 20th and it is great to be with you to welcome you here wherever you are from, however you are joining us, whether you are watching us live on Facebook or YouTube, whether you're tuning in during the week, whether you are catching up a few months or even years down the line, it's fantastic and I'm so thrilled that you have chosen to be with us today to worship, to bring praise and honour and glory to God. My name is Simon and I'm the minister here and it is my great privilege to be able to welcome you this morning. It's good to know that we are being joined by people from all over our local community, people who call this church their home, people who are joining us and new people who have perhaps been joining us a little bit off and on throughout lockdown. And it's good to be joined by people from across the country and across the world, in fact. It's a powerful reminder to us all that we are one family, one church, united in Christ, by Christ, through the Holy Spirit and in the name of God. So just as we prepare ourselves, as we prepare our hearts, as we prepare our minds to gather this morning, let's just take a second or two just to come before God. Oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to gather in corporate worship with one another. We thank you for the technology that has made this possible. We thank you for uh, the provision of things that enable us to be in touch with one another, even during this period of a continued lockdown and continued uh, isolating and continued distancing because of coronavirus. Lord, we thank you that you welcome us. 
we are humbled, we are awed and we are amazed that you would invite us into your courtroom. And we come with thanksgiving, with praise and with joy. We come in the security of knowing that you are the one who has invited us here. We come with the delight of knowing that you have beckoned us in. Lord, we come whether full of faith or nervously treading the waters or dipping our toes in. Lord, we come full of joy or full of challenge, full of sorrow and with weeping and tears. Lord, we come in so many different ways, from so many different places, with so many different hopes, with so many different experiences, with so many different things going on in our lives. But we come. We come to worship you. We come to adore you. We come to lift your name up in praise. And we come not out of any strength of our own or because we have earned the right to be here, but because of Jesus who you gave us and for whose sake and in whose name we are gathered here this morning. May our worship be acceptable to you, Lord. May it be pleasing and may it bring glory and honour to your name in all that we do, in all that we say, in our praying, in our singing, in our reading, in our thinking and our reflecting. Because it's all about you. Today, tomorrow and every day, every hour, every moment of our lives. And we give them to you, Lord, giving ourselves to you again this morning. Amen.
Peekaboo. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And today I wanted to talk to you guys about something that you probably already know, but I know I forget this a lot and, and I think a lot of us do. It's that God is always with you. Now, like I said, you probably hear that all the time. God is always with you. God is everywhere, that sort of thing. But it can be so easy to forget that God is with us. You know, my cousin, she had this baby, this really cute little girl. Her name is Abigail. And sometimes they come to visit my family and and uh, she's getting bigger and she likes to play games sometimes now. But the games that she plays are, you know, just little baby games. Like she loves peekaboo. And peekaboo, basically, you just cover your face and then you say, peekaboo. And she thinks it is hilarious. She thinks it's the funniest thing. Every time I go, peekaboo, she laughs and laughs and laughs like it is the funniest thing she's ever seen. And it doesn't matter how many times I do it, she still thinks it's funny. And so I was asking my dad about that. I said, Dad, why does Abigail think peekaboo is so funny? And my, okay, my dad is really smart and sometimes he, sometimes he over explains some things. But I thought this was pretty interesting, so I thought I'd share it with you guys today. So there's this thing that my dad was telling me about. He said that babies up to a certain point, they don't understand something called object permanence. Basically, it means that if they can't see something, then they don't think it's there. So like if you took one of their stuffed animals and you hit it under the table, they would think it was just gone. They wouldn't think you hit it under the table. And if you're playing peekaboo and you cover up your face, they think you're gone. They think you vanished like a ninja. Now, when you get a little bit older, you realize that if somebody puts a ball under a cup, it's still under the cup. The ball didn't disappear. Unless somebody's doing some sort of sneaky magic trick or something. But even then, it's just an illusion. But even though we understand this concept, even though you and I know that if I cover my face, I'm still here, we still end up forgetting just like a little baby would, especially when it comes to God. Now, it's interesting with God because, well, you can't see God. But I think most of us, especially Christians, have felt God, right? There might be a time where you felt really close to God. You know, God did something amazing for you or, or you, you felt him with you. Or maybe you heard him or, or all, these, all these times where we feel the presence of God. I think it happens more often than we realize. And so we know that God is with us and we've had these times where we've felt God with us. But then hard times come and we forget. When troubles come, we're like, where is God? I don't feel God. God isn't here. God doesn't love me. All these, all these really bad, sad things that we think. And we see examples of this all the time in the Bible where God has done something amazing for somebody and then they turn right around and they're like, where's God? God has forgotten about me. You know, like the Israelites, when they were slaves in Egypt, God rescued them and he, he sent these plagues on Pharaoh and on Egypt and, and he did these amazing, wonderful miracles. He split the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land. And yet when they get out into the wilderness, the Israelites are like, God has abandoned us. He led us out here to die. Like, well, no, of course he didn't do that. Why would he do that? Of course he loves you. Haven't you seen all these things that he's done? And we look at the Israelites and we think, wow, that's really silly for you to think that way. Or we look at, you know, little baby Abigail and we think, wow, that's really silly of you to think that I'm gone when I cover my face. But we do that all the time. It's so easy for us to forget what God has done for us and to feel like he isn't here. So my challenge to you guys today is this. It's next time you feel the presence of God, next time you know God is there for you, next time you recognize that God is at work powerfully. I want you to really remember it. Maybe even write it down. Maybe you could get a little journal and you could write down the times when you feel the presence of God. And then in those times where you really can't feel him or you don't, you don't see him working, you can pull out that little journal. You can remember those times when you have felt the presence of God. Because just because you can't feel him doesn't mean he isn't there, you know? Just because Abigail can't see me when I go like this doesn't mean I'm not right here. And someday Abigail is going to grow up and she's going to know and remember that I'm right here even if I cover my face. So let's all remember the times that we have felt the presence of God. So that even in the times when we feel like we might be alone or we feel like, like God isn't there, we will know that God is always with us. so confusing I am sure of one thing God's by my side yeah when I'm feeling lonely and I start to worry I know God you're near me and you're always by my side yeah 
And I can lift my hands up to you. I can raise my voice and sing. You are who I put all hope in. I will trust you in everything. Thank you.
his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his prayer Have you ever suffered from semantic satiation? Now, before you all panic and think that I'm auditioning to uh, do voiceovers for those dreadful PPI or personal accident insurance claim ads, let me explain a little. If you spend any time at all reading or writing, you've probably experienced semantic satiation at least once in your life before. It's that weird feeling when you've read, you've written, or even spoken a word so frequently that that word itself starts to lose all meaning. Letters begin to look strange and disjointed. Sounds flow into one another, and, and perhaps you even begin to question whether the word you're pondering really exists at all. It's a strange phenomenon, one where words seem to disintegrate before our eyes, or or slip from our tongues as an almost incoherent jumble of syllables that are suddenly so strange and foreign to us. Recently I was writing something and I used the word fragment so often that I genuinely had to go and check in the dictionary that it was a real word and not just something I'd made up that, type, that day. There are words, expressions, phrases even, that we use in church life that I sometimes wonder whether they run the risk of the same issue. For example, when we offer our, our men at the end of prayers, do we do that from habit, from instinct, something that's so ingrained that we've really stopped to think and realise that what we're saying is, I agree. We're giving our consent to what has come before. When we talk about the gospel, do we really have a full sense of the deep, full, true meaning of that word? Or is it another piece of Christianese that we just chuck out there because, hey, that's how we speak? What about when we talk of grace, of mercy, of crucifixion, of communion? The list could go on and on and on. Well, today we're kicking off a series where we're going to look at one of the most incredible prayers, one of the most powerful and significant statements of faith that we find in all of Scripture. It's a blessing that you may have heard dozens, if not hundreds of times before. These are words that perhaps you've had spoken over you, words you've spoken yourself, words you've got somewhere in your house on a poster, on a notebook, some, some postcard somewhere. Words that are so familiar 
that perhaps they've reached the point of semantic satiation. And yet, these words are more than simply polite things to say, far deeper than a handy phrase that we use to sign off our emails and text messages. These are profound, powerful words which convey a deep expression of hope and of confident assurance. The Lord bless you and keep you. Now, if you have a Bible or if you're accessing our text today online or via an app, please turn with me to the book of Numbers. And we're going to be in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 6, verses 22 to 27, but mostly verse 24. So as we prepare ourselves to receive from God what he wants to say to us today, let's just gather together in prayer. Oh Lord, we come with eagerness, with excitement and with anticipation, ready to hear from you. Help us, Father, as we consider these words which are perhaps so familiar to us, so normal for us to hear. Help us to be prepared to encounter them anew, to counter you freshly. Help us, Lord, to lay down our preconceived notions and understandings and to seek your will for us, to seek your revelation for us this morning. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. So begins the priestly blessing. Words given by God to the priests of his people to be spoken over those people. Now, this whole blessing falls at the end of a series of laws that God's people are called to obey. Laws which are given to set the people apart, to increase their holiness, to strengthen them and to enable them to endure the wilderness times that they would soon face. These verses are a beautiful conclusion to these instructions and they offer us a picture of God's sustaining presence throughout Israel's pilgrimage. Far more, though, than mere polite words of basic comfort, this is a powerful invocation, a calling upon the highest being in all of creation to preserve, to nourish, to uphold and to bestow good things upon the people. Ultimately, bringing the peace of God, that shalom peace, through those people to the whole world. Now, though originally given to a specific tribe of Israel, the descendants of Aaron, the priestly line, these words have become a cornerstone of our faith. They are spoken frequently in synagogues and churches alike. The blessing of verses 24 to 26 of Numbers chapter 6 has a huge prominence in the lives of those who believe in God. It's almost unmatched. In fact, aside from the Lord's Prayer, these verses are the most spoken possibly the most familiar in the Christian liturgy. In these poetic lines, we encounter important theological truths and we see revealed a picture of how God is at work throughout history. Perhaps the most significant of the truths that these verses remind us about is that the source of all blessing is God. God is the one from whom all blessings flow, in whom all blessings originate and by whom all blessings are given. God is both the, the cause and the origin of any and all blessings that his people, that's, that's the Israelites in this case, but also you and I receive. It is, in fact, God's very nature to bless his creation. God's blessing of his people is a thread that runs throughout scripture, tying together the acts of God towards and for his people. As early as Genesis chapter 1, we read of God's blessing that is given to humanity whom he has just created. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground. The very first act of God towards humanity is to bless and as God calls a people to himself, the descendants of Abraham, we read again of his blessing. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. 
as the drama of God's work into and through his creation unfolds in scripture, we constantly, we continually see God revealed as the source of all blessings, of all good things, leading ultimately to the complete fulfillment of his blessing when new creation is established. And in Revelation 19, chapter nine, we read this, then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Each and every time we read, each and every time we bear witness, each and every time we see this act of blessing, it is God who is the source. God who has initiated, God who is at work. This is no magical activity whereby humanity is seeking to control the future by manipulating vague spiritual forces. This is no act of new age mysticism, speaking dreams into reality with the law of attraction. This is no following of the secret to achieve satisfaction. No, this is a profound reminder to us that the author of all creation, the author of our salvation, the author of our destiny, the author of all things, God, who spoke the whole of existence into creation, is the one who brings blessing, not us. It is not our actions, it is not our wishes, it is not even our belief, but it is God who does this. And there is something really significant and important for us to grasp hold of here. Friends, there are those, even those who would dare to claim that they are working in the name of and for the sakes of God, who have taken this beautiful truth and perverted it for their own selfish purposes and desires. Those who would suggest that they have some special insight into how God blesses and particular access to the fund of that blessing they would say, if you just pray a particular prayer, if you donate to a particular organisation, if you follow a particular recipe or action, God will bestow his blessing upon you. Friends, that's not how this works. That's not how this works. We don't earn God's blessing by acting in particular ways. We don't bring God's blessing upon ourselves through our own initiative because it's not us who causes the blessing. It's not us, it's God. It's God who is good, God who is great, God who is loving and kind and merciful and whose very nature is to bless his people. It is God who acts towards us as originator and agent of blessing. And as we lay hold of this truth, as we seek to accept this reordering of our understanding, we find incredible comfort and security in this knowledge for it sustains us when we face the trials and challenges of life. So how blessed do you feel right now? The way you answer that question, I wonder if it would change if you locate the source of your blessing in God, who gives all that is good and only that which is good to his people. You see, if we are locating our blessings as a result of worldly things, if we rely on situation and on circumstance to govern our sense of being blessed, then we find ourselves on an unescapable roller coaster ride when we encounter the difficulties and the everyday ups and downs of human existence. If we only say or feel blessed when things are going well, when everything comes up smelling of roses, when every traffic light turns green and we find an extra slice of cake in the tin, then we cannot possibly live our lives as a blessed people. But when we look to God as the source and the supplier of all our blessings, then our whole approach and understanding completely changes. I have a friend who is a non-believer and describes himself quite generally as one of nature's pessimists. And one of his favorite sayings is, never count your blessings. Do you know what? As those who know where the source of our blessings is really found, for us, is it not less a case of not counting our blessings, but actually being unable to count them so prolific and numerous as they are? See, as we turn our focus away from ourselves and the earthly realm around us, as we move our eyes and our hearts and our thoughts heavenwards and place God as the focal point and the centre of our understanding and living, we find ourselves drawn into a new appreciation of what it means to be blessed. 
and a new security in knowing that the blessings we receive are given by the most high, the most mighty, the most majestic power in all creation, and they do not revolve around us. They do not revolve around us. Friends, I'm recording this sermon on Friday. It's the 18th of September today, uh, and this will be broadcast on the 20th. Now, between these two dates is actually a very significant day for us as a family, because the 19th of September is Finn, our middle son. It's his birthday. This year, he turns 10. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Simon, surely not. You are far, far too youthful looking to have a 10-year-old. Clean living. Tomorrow, for me, yesterday for you, Finn will have woken us up at uh, what is likely to be an, an unearthly hour of the day, full of excitement because he knows that in our living room there will be a small pile of gifts awaiting his eager attentions. Now at some point, and let's all pray that I manage to get a coffee in before this happens, but at some point before we've had the chance really to achieve any state of alertness, coloured paper packages will be torn open in a flurry of joy and excitement as the presents, as the gifts that we and others have bought are finally in his hands. And I love that time. I love those moments seeing the joy and the delight on the faces of our children as they open presents, as they receive gifts, as they get the good things, fills me with a sense of joy and delight. As a father, there is genuinely nothing else that brings me as much satisfaction as knowing that I've been able to bring happiness to my children. And this desire to give good things to my offspring, however, is as nothing. Nothing in comparison with God's desire to give good things to his children. Now, sometimes we interpret this concept of blessing in, in entirely practical terms. Sometimes we restrict the suggestion of God's blessing to one of asking for his favour to be at work in our day to day lives. May God help me find a parking spot and make sure I don't get a cold this winter. Now, don't hear me wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that request. It's a great prayer. You know, this understanding reveals to us the truth of God that he is intimately involved with and interested in our daily lives. So pray for that parking space. Pray that you don't get struck with the winter sniffles and give thanks to God when he does bring you those blessings. But the truth is that God's desire to bless is not restricted by our lack of imagination as to what that might look like. God is not restricted or limited like we are. Now, for sure, God's desire is to give his people good things. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus reminds us of this and he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The people of Israel were promised good things. They were promised land. They were promised descendants, good health, protection from enemies and victory ultimately over them. And more besides, and, and we too will find that God's blessing to us is worked out in this way. But there is a far deeper, far more impactful reality revealed in these words. Because these verses point us towards the incredible truth that God's greatest desire is to bless us in the spiritual realm. At its heart, this blessing points us towards the fact that God seeks to be in relationship with his people and to bring them towards knowing his shalom, his perfect peace. Throughout the biblical story, we see God continually reaching out in love and in kindness to those whom he calls his own. The God of Abraham, of Jacob and Isaac, the God of Joseph and Mary, the God who was made flesh in Jesus is the God whose very nature is for humanity. For us as Christians, our greatest blessing is found in Jesus Christ. 
Through Jesus, we are redeemed and restored. We are rescued and renewed. Our separation from God is overcome and we are accepted and adopted into his family. We're called beloved sons and daughters. We're set with co-heirs with Christ and we're inheritors of the promised kingdom that God is bringing into being all around us. The spiritual blessings of God are an intimate act of loving kindness between a father and his children. And we know, we know that we are wonderfully blessed in Christ. We have been pardoned from our wrongdoing and sins. We are given peace, love, joy, that we will inherit eternal life. We are secure in Jesus and given the promise of the everlasting kingdom where we will know God and be with him forever. These are spiritual blessings of God and they are awesome and incredible. And through these blessings, he keeps us. We might best understand this idea of being kept by God as being in receipt of his protection, being those who are under his protection. We know that his presence goes with us, that we are guarded from harm as long as we live our lives for him. And yet at times the reality in which we live feels very different. We do fall ill. We suffer hardship, we endure trial and challenge, and perhaps it feels that actually we're not that blessed at all. So are these verses nothing more than pious wishing? Reassuring to hear and speak, but ultimately meaningless? No. God's blessing goes with us and his protection is upon us. But our limited vision means that sometimes we cannot see how this is playing out. Think of it this way. Let's say you planted a vegetable garden, but nothing was growing because each night various animals would sneak in and eat all the tasty goodness. So you build a covering or, or put a fence around your plants to protect them. In the same way, God protects us from outside harm. We are surrounded by his angels who are guarding us, who are protecting us from those things of outside, from the forces that seek to uh, divert us, from the forces that seek to hurt us. But the truth is your vegetable patch is still under threat because there are pests and bugs which lurk within that, that also attack and seek to devour. So a good gardener would uproot the weeds, would try and get rid of the pests, the caterpillars and the other things that eat away at the vegetables, things that threaten to choke the life out of the good plants. In the same way, God also acts to remove anything that threatens to choke Jesus out of our lives. Sometimes it may feel that when bad things happen to us, when situation and circumstance are dire and the difficulties of life are overwhelming, that somehow God is mad at us, that we've done something wrong and are being punished for our transgressions, that we deserve the hardship. But this is not true because this is not who God is and this is not how God works. John reminds us that God is love. We surely cannot believe the one whose very nature is not just loving, but is actually love itself could desire to harm us. And when we recall that out of his great love, God gave Jesus to die for the sins of humanity, we surely cannot believe that we are being punished for some transgression or other. Friends, Jesus was not misleading us when he said that in this life we would have trouble. For this is the way of the world. There will be challenge, there will be trial, there will be pain and there will be hurt and there will be suffering and there will be tears. But we know that Jesus has overcome the world, that God is victorious and reigning in majesty, sovereign over all the earth. There is no ordeal too big for him to overcome, no adversity too difficult for him to triumph over, no complication, no inconvenience, no misfortune, no pain, no tribulation, no affliction, no burden that is beyond his ability to work through. And throughout these things, he is on our side. He is keeping us and he is blessing us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The heart of the Father is unwaveringly turned towards you. His love unfalteringly surrounds you. His kindness is unendingly at work in and over you. For you are blessed by God, the one from whom all blessings flow, the one who has promised and in whom we can trust completely. The Lord blesses you and he keeps you. 
Let's grasp that truth. Let's hold firm to that reality. Let us live in the fullness that that gives us in our life. The Lord has blessed you. The Lord is blessing you and the Lord will bless you. The Lord has kept you. The Lord keeps you and the Lord will continue keeping you for all your days. For you are his child. And he can do nothing else but love you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your kindness, for your provision, for your security. We thank you for all things that you do for us. And Lord, we know and we admit there are times where we don't see that. Times when situations and circumstances seem so difficult that we, we cannot see your blessing, we cannot feel it, we cannot understand it. Yet, Father, we declare the truth of who you are. We declare the truth of what you have done and we declare the truth of your promises. We are blessed and kept and we thank you for that, Lord. So help us to be a people who live in that truth. For we pray in the name of the one who came, the greatest blessing of all, the one who keeps us in you, our Lord Jesus. Amen.
drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good.
Friends, we are nearing the end of our time together this morning and I pray that you have been blessed, that you've been encouraged, that you've been uplifted, that you've heard God speaking, felt his spirit at work moving in and around and through you. And we'd love to hear what God has been doing in your life. We'd love to know how he has been at work and we'd love to pray with you, whether that is prayers of joy and celebration or whether that is prayers to invite God into situations. So so do please reach out to us. You can find us in so many different ways. You can find us on the internet at www.stonehousebaptist.org.uk. You can email us on contact at stonehousebaptist.org.uk. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you're already aware of this. But if you're over on YouTube, you might want to hunt us out on Facebook. And that is www.facebook.com forward slash stonehousebaptist. We genuinely would love to be in touch with you. We'd love to keep in touch. So reach out to us. We are here, eager and waiting. Friends, it's been a pleasure to be with you. It really has been a genuine pleasure. There are some activities that are coming up over the week ahead and they will just flash up on your screen now. There are a few things that are regular events that are happening and a few things that are one-off events that are taking place. So if you're interested in any of those things, do get in contact with us. Uh, we'd love to have you involved. We'd love to welcome you into those things that we're doing, ways that we are trying to serve and love and know God better. It just falls to me now to close us with a blessing. And as we are considering the blessing from Numbers 6, what better way to finish than by sharing in these magnificent words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.